All right, I'd like to welcome everybody to viewing this video. We've been having a lot of calls about putting down hard deck floor. I did a few videos on covering the aircraft and when I bought AirTech, this product came along with it. And like I've said in the videos earlier, I've covered aircraft for almost 30 years, but did very little floor. So I've kind of had to learn this as we go. My son Grant here, we've did two or three hangers so far. A lot of them was going over an old paint that was kind of peeling and there's a lot of techniques to that. I'll get into that as, we, as we're painting, I'll talk about that. But we're gonna do a, a little three car garage here and I'm gonna try to cover most of the stuff that I've been taught from Mac and the different ones. The first one is prep. And if you read the instructions, I'm probably going to write one more set of instructions that has a lot of the corners and stuff that come along with this that different people have told me from a beginner standpoint of what to expect. But when we talk about getting the concrete prepped is, is you're not wanting a sealer on it. If you have a sealer that's been put down on it, it's going to have to be ground off or scuffed off with a with a unit with a say an 80 grit or 100 grit pad, you're gonna to have to break that surface. But in the book when it says acid etch or scuffing the surface, the only time that needs to be done is when your concrete guy, if you come down here close, a lot of times they will do a really nice finish and it's just, I mean, just almost like glass. What's gonna happen is, is the paint, we're not really thinning the paint down enough to really soak in there very good. So this shiny part has to go away. That can be done with going to your local rental place and renting a round buffer, and just buy you a box of pads, you can do it wet. If you've got some oil spots at that time, go ahead and do it wet, put a little bit of Dawn dishwashing liquid, sand it, you know, work it in. And if you're going that route, or going over an older paint, trying to just get a, a etch there, like we talk about on the aircraft paint, uh, giving it an etch to grab a hold, you're gonna make a slurry. And I learned this, don't get too far ahead of your slurry. You know, if you do a, say, a 20 by 10 area, stop, get the hoses out in the brush and get that gone. Because I've had that slurry dry, and when it dried, it turned right back to an epoxy or something, it wouldn't just rinse off. So you can etch one by sanding it, or when they talk about an acid etch. An acid etch is not a trademark name, it's just you're etching the concrete and getting the surface of it to where it can accept the paint and grab it. What Mac told me the best thing to use is just go to your local Lowe's or wherever you need to go and get you a muriatic acid. We found some here, get you a 31% or somewhere in the mid thirties. Just buy you a cheap sprayer like this and mix it through one part to three parts water, one part acid to three parts water. If it's a, like a mid thirties, 30, this is a 31.49. So it's a three part, you're mixing it. One part acid to three parts water. And what we're gonna do, first off, if you don't know if you've had a sealer put down, Max said that if you mix that up and you do just a light spray, as long as you see a white foam come up, you're good, it's doing its job. If it doesn't foam at all, your concrete guys has put some kind of a curing seal or something on there that you're gonna to need to get the mechanical buffer with the sand and run over. Now I can put the paint directly on this and it'll probably be fine I just, I'm always worried about that nightmare phone call. I spent $10,000 doing this huge hanger floor and it's peeling up. Product looks beautiful, but it's peeling up in sheets. And that's the point of getting it to stick to that concrete. Um, I did a little test spot here and what you're wanting, and if you do the whole thing, you may not know it, but over here, I had put down just a little shot of acid and let it set for about 30 seconds and then I just kind of wiped it away. And if I run my finger across here, I mean, I can't do this over the video, but I can feel slick. And then when I cross that, I can feel this like maybe 800 grit or 1000 grit sandpaper. You know, that's all you're wanting is something to just put that little edge to it. What we're gonna do, I'm gonna wet. I'm gonna put some more water. I'm gonna wet from here out. If you've got a situation like this, when we're done, Matt told me when it quits foaming, your actual concrete is a base, it's gonna start neutralizing it right off the bat when you put it down. 
Then you add some more water, dilutes it more. But I don't want to be a situation here to where I'm washing acid out here. It's not going to really hurt it at this point, but I don't want to start making streaks. So I want to go ahead and get water from here out and have it, you know, wet. So if anything was still active, it's going to dilute even more. And, you know, and once we clean this room out, we're going to wash all the way out. Um, I haven't really got a handle on how long it needs to lay down at first. We're just going to play this by ear. But I think it neutralizes itself, but it's not going to keep eating. Now, I've had some people call, and I think they got a little, little heavy on their acid and didn't reduce it enough. And I've heard of it actually flaking up concrete or doing too much. So I think that's the reason you're reducing it, you know, to one part to three parts water. Uh, I've got a piece of rubber part here. What we're going to do is just carry this around the side just to keep from splashing up on the wall. You may want to take a little more precaution. I may actually just stay away from the wall on this job because I'm not really concerned right against the wall with it trying to peel because there's not a lot of traffic or anything on that. And if you're not going to do the sanding, you're going to do the acid etch. That's where you want to get some Dawn dishwashing liquid if you've got some oil leaks or whatever. The other thing is if you've got new concrete and you know you're going to use our product, talk to your concrete guy and just tell him what you're needing. You don't want broom finish. I mean, that's really rough. But just tell him we don't really want to go overboard on the trialing of it. We just want it to get down to about a you know 800 grit fill or something, and he can you know stop at some point there, and that and that'll give you a good good spot to go from. Them. So I think that covers that part. What we'll do is me and my son will get started, and we'll just do a little filming and through here. I'm planning on laying it down. I'm planning on adding some more water in here on it and then sweeping it out, trying to get it all neutralized, you know, as possible. Um, like I said, I was told that the concrete's a base itself and it's going to be trying to neutralize it. Uh, at this point, you're wanting to tie up the dogs, the cats, the birds, everything that's going to come in here or, or act up through the whole process of painting or whatever. Um, but, you know, just it's probably going to be a little bit of foaming off in here and a little bit of air, so you kind of want a little ventilation when you're doing this. So we're going to go ahead and, you know, we probably, possibly would have not even etched this, but for the video purposes, I'm going to go ahead and try this etch part because I need to, this is actually my first hands-on etch. I've been around it, but, you know, just want to have this so that you know what to expect when doing our product. So at this point, we'll get kind of started and we'll start to film back up on, on just spraying some of that around. Coming up very long, but it is making that little edge to it, so I'm not as worried about this having I've had something put on it. A little faster. I don't know if the if the acid, the acid was not the newest in that jug, but I think it's still pretty hot because it was smoking when we pulled the lid off and moved it around a little. Uh, the only reason I know it is working when I did that test and filled my hand across it, it was leaving a little bit of an etch to it, so it's going to be fine for what we're doing. I'm supposing that when Max said that if it does not foam at all, then that might be it's not even leaving that little foam right there. But it's foaming up. It's, the foam is dying off pretty quick. We're not going all the way to the walls. So. so it looks to be a matter of just, just laying that off. The fiends are not real bad in here or anything. It's just getting some, getting it on, the, on all of the surface there. So at this point, we'll go ahead and I, I can see it smoking across there, so it is, it is working. At this point, we'll go ahead and uh, stop the film and we'll go ahead and go across the whole carport and then we'll start wetting it down at that point. All right, I wanted to show this little part right here. And like I've always said in a lot of my videos, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, I know it's acid, but I got water right over there. I just squirted a little shot down here. This was really slick. And uh, you know if you're doing something when you try to cross that, and I can just feel it just ever so slightly, a little bit of a pull and a grip. It ain't gonna look much difference, but that little bit of a grip right there it's just enough to get that little sandpaper feel, and that's kind of what we're looking for. We're going to go ahead and just go on out with it, and then start bringing the water back on and washing it. Uh, after I get done washing, I know one of the things that was mentioned was is when you're completely done 
and it dries the next day, if you have any white cloud to it or something, you need to get a mop and do it one more time. You want that residue to go away. That's sort of a calcium or something that will be pulled up from the top out of the concrete and you want that to go away. All right, at this point he's finishing up and I noticed that where we had sprayed it, it was slowly kind of drying off and, and I do believe that that concrete does neutralize it quite a bit. But just for safety, I'm coming back and just wetting over, just more dilution. That's just, this is purely me. I may be just wasting my time. I'm careful not to go over there and splatter it up on the wall. I think it's so diluted it won't do anything. You know, you're going to come from the wall back this way. Uh, one part that I wanted to come back on was we noticed that uh, he had been bringing the vehicles here several times, and we figured out that this is armor off. When they clean the vehicle and do the armor off. So it might be best if you've got that situation to go ahead with some Dawn or something and do a hand scrub where you think your tires or something has been. Probably not going to affect anything. I just know that the acid wasn't smoking up and etching quite as good where that armor off was. It was acting like somewhat of a sealer. So that's one place you may want to may do a little extra cleaning before you start. So uh, I guess at this point, he's finished up. I'm going to go ahead and neutralize it. And we're going to sweep it on out and squeeze it. And if it dries tonight, we'll start back tomorrow and uh, start laying down the, the cover. All right. After we got everything washed out and brushed, I think it'd be handy to get a squeegee or something like this. If you're like me, you're pushing time and you want to get dry in the next day or so and not have puddles of water, this would be a good idea to go along and use a squeegee, get all your puddle waters out. Uh, we checked it out here, and on this is about 800 square feet, and it didn't take but about two quarts of acid and the water related with that. So wasn't enough really there, and it done diluted, and we diluted it with water and kind of got out there. We tested a couple spots, and it wasn't, you know, what it'll do is just change it, and it'll clean it. And, you know, unless you're going to clean the whole thing, uh, you don't want streaks in it, but it never tried to streak anything. We just, for precautions, we wet, wetted it all the way out. One other deal, other thing, which we already knew this, me and my brother-in-law from the old trucking, trucking days, that here's a storm cell, it's got aluminum top. We wanted to really stay away from that because when the acid hits it, it actually cleans it or gives it a different shade color and it's gonna look bad if you just get splatters on it. So we, we made it a point to stay kind of away from that and not to, to mar the finish up or just make it look modeled or something different. So we're gonna finish this up and we'll check it in the morning and see if it's dry enough. That's gonna be your key is not to push it. Make sure that you are dry enough to, uh, we're gonna run some fans on this tonight and see what it looks like in the morning. And whenever we think it's dry enough, we'll come back and start the, start the process. All right, this is the next day and We've inspected it and it's a dry day. Everything looks to be dry. Everything feels pretty good as far as the texture. Uh, reading over some stuff last night, some of the customers has wrote back, emailed me back as far as their views on the first time. Some of them maybe was concerned about using the acid etch on a brand new concrete. They went on ahead with a 60 grit. If it was trialed out slicker than they wanted to, if they didn't have control on telling the concrete guy to, you know, maybe don't get it real glass finished that they went on ahead and just used a 60 grip. Uh, the guy did mention that there was a lot of sweeping and then the dust would come up and then lay back down so they ended up mopping so it was when they did the grinding or the, the using the 60 grit or 60 to 100 grit it did create some dust. But uh, I don't see anything that's the, Mac had said make sure you don't have the white film after it's dry, everything looks to be good on that. What we're gonna do on this, since it's a carport, we're gonna go now around the edge with a piece of two inch tape, and we're gonna go ahead and just mix up a small amount, one to one, and we probably won't thin it, and we use just a four inch brush, and we'll go ahead and cut the sides with the, this is gonna be a pearl gray, and we probably won't come back in with a second coat because we're not gonna thin it, and with a brush, you can put it on a little thinner, a little thicker, and we're not going to worry about coverage. It's going to probably cover fine using a brush. So just one time we're going to cut in 
and then our rollers will just come up on that four inch wide area uh, and we'll just leave the tape up there until after we put the clear down and everything. So at this point we're going to go ahead and go around the outside edge and on this one and tape it. One thing, if you've got a hanger, a lot of times people will have the, the R panel or whatever metal on the inside that has the ribs. You know, you just take the tape and just follow that. Uh, you know, you might even leave a spot. Or if it's a new hanger, you may have, have your contractor don't do the interior wall yet, so you can just go ahead and paint past where your protective wall is going to be, and then they can put it on, and you don't have to worry about, you know, going around the sides. So at this point, you'll be your cut in around your walls and everything that you're going to do. So we'll go ahead and take care of that, and we'll probably go ahead and mix up some without the thinner and go ahead and put the, you know, about a four inch stripe around the side. All right, here's one little spot I wanted to put in here. A customer had called me. The cure we have made for our product, it, it, the way it comes, I've had people call and they'll call me up and say, looks like it's ruined or something's wrong with it because it's got a lot of liquid on top. That's just the nature of it. It has a peanut butter texture to it. And there's always a liquid on the top. Make sure you don't pour none of that off. That all needs to go in with your mix, your one-to-one. -one. Now this is just the cure, the catalyst. The gray part of the epoxy is another part, but I just want to show one thing. If you open the lids, it's got liquid on the top and it's about like peanut butter. You gotta have a pretty substantial stick and scrape and scrape and scrape to get it all out. Um, he mentioned to me and it worked real well, I'm gonna try it. He said actually the night before works the best, but even a couple hours. By turning this upside down, if I pull the lid off this and pour the clear off, you would sit there and hold it and you say, well, it ain't, it just barely will move. But by turning it upside down, he said it'll completely swap ends and it's a lot easier to clean out. So I'm just gonna open these lids and this is only set for about 45 minutes. Now I may be filming something that totally don't, don't even work here. It's been shook around and drove up here. Normally it's actually a clear that's sitting on the top right there. So I guess whenever I get ready to pour it out, it's not going to be much. I guess we, we drove over to this site this morning, and I guess driving in the truck probably kind of mixed that up a little. So I guess they look the same, but you can shake it and tell that it is, it's a very thick consistency, and then the top is just a almost a clear. So what he was saying is probably a good idea to uh, turn them upside down, maybe the day before, and that'll slowly let them swap ends, and it makes it a lot easier uh, to get out. Uh, read the instructions very good on the weather, the barometer, which way it's moving. You know, you don't want to be in a situation to where it's being cool, like in the fall or, or whatever, and the temperature's on the rise and the next morning, every, you've seen it where the concrete's dripping wet and the walls are dripping wet. You don't want that situation. You want a dry situation when you're putting the product on. Uh, read the instructions thoroughly, probably a couple times to get a good, good handle on everything. The, we provide a reducer for the color part, not for the clear, but for the color part. And what a lot of times that's best used for is, is to get the residue out of the can or whatever. And I think the instructions call for no more than about a pint of reducer per mixed gallon. So if, if I've got a gallon of the gray resin and a gallon of the cure, I probably use a pint of reducer in this one to clean it out and a pint in this one to clean it out. And the book says that's about, that's about the limit, you know, that you want to reduce it. You do want to reduce it to where it, you can tell the difference when you're painting it out that it is rolling a lot smoother and stuff. Uh, I would, you know, if you was going to reduce it any more at all, it might be just on the first pass so that you know that it's thin enough that it's getting a soakage in the concrete because that's your mechanical bite. Everything else will be stacked off of that first coat. So we've got all the interior braced off. We're gonna go ahead and just take a small cup, mix a one-to-one. -one. Like I said before, we're gonna go ahead and cut that. I just wanted to go to that, that when you open this, it looks like something's wrong with it if they've been sitting a long time, but that's just the normal separation of it. Um, the guy mentioned also, I think I'm gonna to put together one more cheat sheet to go out with all the product when people buy it. And it's something you kinda of don't ever think about. Bring that over, Grant. You can, uh, one thing is, is if you've got a variable speed drill or something, that's better because if it's a one speed, that thing wants to, it's either on or off and it wants to sling it everywhere. Uh, 
ain't much difference in doing it down or up. A lot of times I like to do it to where it's bringing it up off the bottom. But another thing is, is to, you know, you can buy these for five, six dollars at a, at a hardware store. But the thing is, is he run into was make sure that the chuck that you have on your drill will match this before you start the project. They actually started pouring the stuff up and then found out that the chuck was too small for their, for their stir. And then they were frantic running around the airport trying to find one to match. So make sure that everything works and is, is laid up before you start. Also, a good idea is, uh, is your, just some cheap, you know, rubber gloves, you know, just natural because it is an epoxy and if you don't get it cleaned off, if it starts to dry, it does, it does take a while to come off your skin and everything. So we're going to go ahead and get this and cut in and get, get it took care of. All right, we're ready to mix some of the, the product here. The, like I said, the, the gray, well, this is gray, the color is a one-to-one -one, and there's not really a need of stirring in these individual pots to mix it up because then you're gonna you're gonna contaminate your your spinner one way or the other uh, you're just gonna put them over and scrape out or whatever just for information we we cut in about four inch wide with non thinned paint and we did a about 140 running feet and that took probably between a quart and a quart and a half somewhere there of, of, of mixed paint so just for your information you know if you if you have a small job that you got a certain amount to and you use some of your paint to cut in, I know it does take up three inches of your floor space, but you're going to be rolling back up on that again, so it, it might could possibly run your, your product a little short. Uh, we'll go ahead and start putting this in, and like I said, not a need to mix this. You can go ahead and scrape it out with a scraper. I like to, I should just lay this right here. I like to go ahead and get my gray in first or my color. And when I mentioned the thinning, you know, it, it says a pint per mixed gallon. So this is a little pint container. Uh, you can use it however, how, whatever kind of container you want. I'm just using this because we had it and I knew the amount. Um, when you scrape these out, normally I use the thinner to get the rest out of the, the pot. And one thing to keep in mind is contamination. Like I said before, you're stirring. At some point, if you get some of this in a jug of this that's not going to be used today, it's going to ruin it when you put the lid on it. I mean, you want to make sure, we're going to use this all product, but you want to make sure of cross-contamination that you're not, uh, you know, dipping something into the catalyst or over into the other. And there'll be a film left. It's just according to how hard you want to really, you know, scrape on it. But that's, yeah, it's, I can see the bottom ribs of the can, so that's in good shape there. This product might be a little better to take some of it out with a scraper first. And like I said, I had transferred some of this to different cans is the reason it didn't when I did the earlier part of the video about its separation. But when it's been sitting on the shelf for a while, before I send it to you, it will be a clear liquid on the top. And the guy mentioned that, you know, flipping it around makes it, makes it settle out good. So for this two gallons, this is gonna be about the max of reducer. And I believe that the reducing it does help it uh, soak in the concrete just a little better and get a little smoother finish. And as we start applying, I'll start mentioning the things that I've found out putting the product on. As far as going back over what's already been painted, you wanna kinda of limit going back over something that started to catalyze because then your roller will, will pick up, you know, and make a texture on it. We sell the rollers. Uh, if you provide your own roller, make sure you get a high quality one. It, it's not going to leave, uh, you know, fibers behind because by the time you put the clear on it and the clear lays down and flows away, that fiber will be sticking up. Uh, we, you know, like I said, we sell the, the good rollers and the pans. And I'll mention on the pan on cleanup here toward the end when we do that.
And one of the keys is, is to just thoroughly get this mixed. You don't want to splatter it and get it on you, but you want to make sure you're going to the bottom. And if it's a variable speed, that works the best and you're not, you know, getting it splattered up everywhere. And it's, and it's probably a good idea to sit here and mix this for, you know, four or five minutes, you know, you thoroughly, because you want every molecule to be touching the mo other molecules and hardening in it. So we'll go ahead and finish, finish mixing all this up, and uh, next point we'll be moving inside to start painting. Okay, we've got our pan poured up. One thing I wanted to mention, uh, you know, just get you some small two to three gallon pails, mixing it a couple gallons at a time. It always works best. Don't, I ain't saying one person can't do this, but it works real good if one person's gonna be doing the painting, one mixing or two doing the painting. If you've got a mixer, that way the painters never have to really stop. But just, uh, you're just gonna, you're gonna throw away these pails anyhow. Just get you cheap pails to do your mixing in. Uh, you got a pretty good pot life on this that, you know, I wouldn't go, you know, over an hour or two. I mean, it's going to start getting thick. Uh, when we mixed that while ago, I did realize that we had used a little bit out of the top of that uh, can. So I put the full pint. So this is maybe thin just a touch over, but it just gives you the general idea of if you're getting the stuff out of the can, don't go over about a pint per gallon. So Grant's going to go ahead and get started and, uh, We'll just go ahead and I like to go ahead and, and keep my pan out in front of me and just drag it with the, with the roller. You're going to string it. You're going to string it over to where you're starting. Just don't worry about that as long as you're just taking that out as you go. Uh, the first coat, you're not worried about coverage as far as if you've got a dry spot in the concrete, looks like a light spot. This is not the time to be, you know, because the product is giving you enough product to put two coats of this down. Uh, another thing is when you load the brush up and you make your first pass toward the wall, you want to stop right before the wall. Don't push a ridge up there. Yeah, do like he's doing and bring it back because if you push a ridge of paint up there, it doesn't want to cure as good. You want to make sure that all your in-between uh, your roll patterns, you're kind of bringing that out and you're just kind of doing a long pattern. Go ahead and do a little longer area there, about a six foot area. Once you get going like that, then you're going to do what I call W's. You know, when you're going back up, you're cutting across and you're coming back this away and this away. And there's not a need to just keep going over and going over. Uh, I found that just the raw paint coming out, it, it's going to have a little texture to it, but if you come back after it's set for 10 or 15 minutes, then it's going to try to get sticky on you. So just kind of work your paint out like he's doing, and you see the little ridge he's got left, at some point he'll reach back and he'll pick that paint back up, keep that ridge down to a minimum. And we'll go ahead and kind of get started and come back and I'll talk about, I like to go in a big hanger. If you had two people doing it, I found that if this person starts on this side and that person starts on that side, just make sure both of you are coming out to about the same level and you're coming out to a center spot. And then when you start again, like in here, we'll go all the way across, then come back over here, because if you just go over there and then come back and come back, this has set an awful long time right here. So as soon as you can come back here, and we'll do the same process here. And once you get over about five foot, then you want to step up in this corner and bring it out and dress it in. And that way you don't have, you don't have no paint piled up. So we'll go ahead and do some of it and come back. All right, one thing I want to show you here, you can kind of see a little gray through it and we're not worried about that coverage, but that little line, the second coat, that'll pretty well go away. But if you keep mashing, you keep leaving this line. Once you get across just a little bit, on the last part, just hold your, just put no pressure on it and just let the brush weight itself go across and it'll pretty well take that line out as you go. These little lines like this, once he's made two or three and got the paint down, just lighten up on that brush a little bit and that line will pretty well go away. Uh, we're probably pushing it on you know, if I keep coming back and keep coming back, I'm going to start pulling up and pulling up paint and it's going to start getting even more texture. 
this texture is just going to be there. The clear lays down a lot smoother and it kind of runs that texture together. Like I said, we're not worried on the first coat about full coverage. It's more acting like a primer coat. When you get paint out and it drips, don't really worry about it, like I said. But do, if it does have a drip and it's been there very long, make sure you do roll it on out to where it flattens out and it's not, it's not standing up. One thing to mention, if you're Mike like me, when it gets above about 32 degrees outside, you sweat. It's good to have a paper towel or something in your back pocket because as you start working and start dripping sweat on the raw concrete, it does affect it. It won't, it won't. Everywhere there's a drop of water, the paint don't want to stick. So it's kind of a good idea to keep your face wiped down and everything. I've noticed that while I'm doing it and leaning forward and every drop, it kind of, the paint kind of acts funny and wants to beat up on it wherever it's wet. I see Grant's kind of going back to the ends and making sure there's no bridged up paint. He's not really worried about covering over on the new part. He's just making sure there's no pile. Because everywhere there's a pile, it's that much longer to cure before we can put the next coat on. These little spots like this, we're not, we're not really worried about. You know, that's about the limit of what you want because you, you want it to actually cover good. But like I said, we're not dwelling on it. More so, we're dwelling on these little lines right here kind of just leveling them down and that way everything looks smooth. On a big hanger, it's usually best to have two roller pans and that way each person can be at their own end and coming toward the middle to meet. But this is just a small garage. I've seen times where it'd be an older concrete floor that had a chip out of it where some piece of machinery or something has gouged a little kit, a chip out of it. And I've seen Grant come up to one of those chips and turn the, the roller up on its edge and put the corner of the roller down in that chip to get the paint go down in it. And that way it kind of feel, don't fill it completely full with, with paint, but it, it, the way you can, if you've got an uneven concrete, this little place that the 18 inch roller is wanting to bridge across, just kind of turn the roller up on the edge and it can get down in those spots. And like I said before, we, we cut in around this storm cellar door. And that way it would go a little faster. We taped it off and we painted what we wanted to paint on it. Uh, if you're doing a garage or a hangar, we went on ahead and decided to put a line to where none of the gray was showing on the outside because it doesn't actually match the outside of the house. So we put a paint line of just where the garage door is going to shut down. And while things are drying, either leave stuff open or put a block under it so that you, you, know, you don't want your door or whatever to stick during the drying process. Even if it's just a day or so old, it could still stick i would always leave a leave a little gap under it until it gets cured out we've got a couple of windows open the smell's not very bad at all in here it's the clear that has a pretty good odor uh, one customer said that the 3m mask really helped knock that down a lot uh, another spot and i'll mention it again when we're putting the clear on is having light you know, we can see through the windows here and see, you know, this is easy because we, we know where we've been, but when you put the clear on, it's amazing how that shiny part, you'll have little spots that you may miss and having plenty of light to see the glare, just like that door, you can see that glare in the door. When you're putting that uh, clear down, if you've got a new hanger that doesn't have the lights in it yet, 
sometimes we just can't help that, but if there's any way at all you can have electricity in or plenty of doors open or have lighting, it makes it much easier putting the clear down. That's basically the technique that I have. I'll stop it and start it up here in a minute. It's just uh, it's, it's going across it, making like large W's. They're, they're kind of in each other's way on this one, but when you're by yourself, that's kind of a long stretch right there, but that'll have it where they only be about three passes across here. I don't know if Grant, do you have anything you want to add as far as what you see or what you're doing to someone that's never did this before? Well, if you, we're making pretty good progress across here, but if you have to go back after a while on one day like today, see this paint down here has already started to stick in, set up, so you wouldn't want to come back down here. Now it's, when, we, when he's saying sticky, it's it's still very wet, but when he's saying sticky... If I was to roll across there, that would bring up that paint and make a texture, and you don't want to do that. You want to keep everything pretty much the same texture along there. You know, as Grant was getting down about 20 foot, it's kind of at that point, make a look back and notice and say, right now is the point to come back and maybe smooth a little something out and take care of it. Like I did earlier, kind of dressed my end across here in that way. There's no yeah. high ridges or high spots and just kind of very lightly not pressing down. So if you press down too much, you might actually make another ridge. So just lightly just kind of smooth away all the imperfections. Like right here, you know, there's a couple little high spots. And just lightly bring it across here. And see, like right there was one, and it just kind of, and right here, see that's a little bit high? Just roll over the edge of it, and that smooths it out, and makes it like the rest of the concrete. So just kind of let it roll across. Go ahead and take those lines away right there. As he went to the end, he picked up while he was rolling. He didn't stop. He just picked up while it was in motion. Because if you stop and change directions, it makes that little line. Like that right there. See, I'll, I'll do away with that line. I'll See that line over there? That's where it stopped. I'll start down here so there's not a secondary line. And I'll just roll. So I, at that point. And those lines are not the end of the world. It's, it's amazing how this second coat is going to cover. Uh, this is more so treating it like a, what I call a primer coat. You know, we're just getting, we're worried about getting it thin and even on the on the concrete. And the only thing I'm mentioning on this is the ridges is, is that ridge is gonna take twice as long to cure. And we're wanting, if you're like me, you're ready to put this second coat on today. You know, and just read the instructions on the temperature and the cure times and your final test on seeing if it's cured enough to put the next coat on because I've seen the next coat, or especially the clear coat, go on a little too soon, and it wants to react with the one under it. The one under it hasn't fully cured, and I've actually seen the clear, our high solid clear that we make. Uh, we have a special hardener made that goes with that, but we make the clear. It's fairly harsh while it's trying to dry, and I've seen it actually pull this paint and make a little bubble if it's put over this paint a little too soon. So really adhere to the instructions on your timeline. So we'll go ahead and I'll stop the video and we'll move on across and start it up here toward the end. All right, one thing I wanted to mention, I don't know that I've ran into it or not, but you know, these cheap buckets, I'm coming out here and mixing two more gallons. If you've got several people painting, you may actually have a five gallon bucket putting two gallons of gray and two gallons of curie in, and that's, that's fine. Um, you, when you mix your paint, it's good to let it what we call cook for just a little bit, you know, at least five, 10 minutes, you know, before you actually start painting. That's where it's always good to have someone out here mixing while they're rolling. That way they've still got some paint left, but I'll have this mixed and ready to go where they can just go nonstop. If you do have to have a stopping point, it's not the end of the world. It's not gonna be a major line. A lot of people will find a saw mark or a squared off part in the shop where an expansion joint or something is, and that works great. But what I wanted to mention was is about the pot life, you know, there's, as you see, there's paint left in that. Well, I'm going to put more paint in that and keep mixing it. And you probably, that could continue through the day, but I feel like at some point, 
that outer surface of that is going to start curing to the point that, you know, if you had, say, a five or 10,000 square foot hanger, that you might end up with some paint that's going ahead and curing and turning into a little slobber or something that's going to get mixed with your new paint. So it might be a good idea every two or three mixers or something, you might switch to a new bucket just so that older catalyzed, you know, I'm going to mix it thoroughly and it's going to mix with that, but I've always kind of thought about that if some older paint in that bucket goes ahead and catalyzes and then it's just kind of a little glob of something mixed in with your fresh paint. So you might want to keep that in mind when you when you buy your buckets, just get, get some extra ones of them. take your fingernails so we went ahead and let it cure another day uh, we've took a blower as you saw and blowed off anything the dust you know or anything like that that's in there I mentioned before about when you go on this second coat sometimes uh, your shoes will leave a little dusty print uh, some people want to wear like a booty or just a little something just for finger footprints because actually it's more pronounced when you go in for the last time to put the clear on. This time won't be as important because you're putting another coat of paint. I do see every now and then this will happen, these little kind of a little bit of a white cloud or something, just a little discoloration. And I'm not really sure what that is. It's, it's just a calcium of some sort possibly or whatever's coming out of the concrete because we put the first coat on very, very thin. I mean, in most cases, this would be fine that you normally see a carport painted, but there is places in it that's, uh, that, that's got some little light spots that's just come up through. This next coat will go over that fine. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, uh, when you're cleaning out your first shot, most of the time the pans that we sell, if you pour it out, about all it'll pour, and then let it dry, if you're careful, you can get a hold of the paint and actually just peel it out and actually can reuse the, the, the paint. The little spotty edges here sometimes are hard to, hard to get loose. You can get them loose, but if you're careful, you can get a whole sheet out of that. So at this point, we done showed you on the first go around about mixing. We're gonna go ahead and mix our next batch. In this case, a pearl gray, one to one, blend it with the drill and uh, get it all you know thoroughly mixed. And we're gonna start putting on our second coat. All right, we've got our paint mixed up for our second coat. A uh, few things I wanted to mention, you know, there, there's a light texture to it, and, and from when I talk to everybody, I think that's what most people kind of want, because their first question is, is this product slick? Well, the clear that goes on top of it flows a little better than the paint that goes on, so we're not really worried that much about the, the texture, you know, the little bit of texture from the rover. I did have a customer, we're, we're going to try that with this one, is uh, when they talk about putting sprinkles in. now. This is out of my expertise. I've did it a couple times. What we're gonna do is, is uh, we're gonna take, they, my, they bought some sprinkles that were gray and black and blue to go on this gray. There is all kind of ways you see them do it. You get any videos on YouTube and these guys are just experts at this. You'll see them throwing it out by hands full if it's thick. They'll see them with a spinny thing like a, a fertilizer spreader or something. And on small areas like this or whatever, I'm afraid if I try to do a spreader that the overlap might be a dark area. And I have done it like in a couple little offices this way. And it's just a, what, I, what I'm using here is a mozzarella can. It's got the three big holes. And don't mess up like I did. Get this side taped down. I mean, I was doing an excellent job. And then all of a sudden this one come open. And when you get it stuck down to the wet paint, you can't do nothing about it. What we're gonna do here, well, to back up, I had one customer that they wanted texture, and I've seen people in the first coat of paint have some kind of a sand and different situations that mix in to, to put a little texture to it. I've never done that with our product. I'm sure it'll work. What he did was put sprinkles on the first coat of paint, 
Then when it cured, come in and vacuum and sweep up all the loose because some of them's not going to stick. And what he did was put the second coat of paint and he coated the sprinkles. He wasn't worried about the visual. He was wanting the sprinkles there for texture. And if you think about it on this, what we're going to do is, is he's going to start rolling. And I'm going to, I'm going to need to look into it. I see it all the time on the videos. They put the little spike shoes so that when you have painted, they can actually walk back up on the paint with spike shoes and it doesn't really, you can't see a mark. I need to find a source for those because people are calling me and they say they're having trouble finding them. So I don't have the spike shoes. So my son's just going to do short sections to where I can do it like this away. And with the small holes, it's not putting out much. That way you can just, it ain't coming out all at once. You just put little light areas and you can visually see it. And if you need a little more, it's a matter of having to shake it three or four times to get a little more in there. And then you can visually kind of get it laid out to that point. But the way we're doing it, we're going to put it on the wet paint. And after it cures, there's going to be some of these that ain't going to stick. They're going to, they're going to just not stick to the paint quite. And you'll want to sweep up or vacuum or whatever before we go with the clear. And what the clear is going to do is when you put the clear on the sprinkles, they're going to help hold them down. But after it flows out, the clear will somewhat run, you might say run off the sprinkle. You know, you're going to feel this flake. I call it sprinkle, the, the flake. You're going to feel it which is going to give you a texture. They're doing it for the visual effect. Uh, in my personal shop, aircraft shops, I don't want any of these around because I drop a number four screw and I've done spent three hours looking for that stupid screw that looks like one of these little flakes and I'm down here laying on the side and everything. So uh, what we're going to do, he's going to start just laying the second and like we mentioned in the first, and it may be a little more critical here, is when, you, uh, when he's putting the paint on, doing the W's, dressing the ends, the little lines, you know, kind of running them out and just holding the brush light and not pressing. Because when you press it down, you're pushing the paint out the side, doing that light, trying to just make an even coat over everything. The clear is going to help hide any lines also. But this is the coat that's going to fill in, you know, the little places where you can kind of see the dark concrete under. This was just our primer coat, you might say. So we'll get started and at some point after uh, I kind of get it regulated and see how thick they want the sprinkles, then we'll do a little bit more filming of me putting this on. All right, we've determined about how thick they want them. Uh, like I said, I have seen them just throw them out by the hands full. Uh, this is about how thick they want. And the reason I just personally am doing this, it's not professional by no means, it, it takes a little bit of sprinkles to put just a few down. So that way I'm not, I'm not, fixing to put too many in one spot, except maybe where I overlap. So I go ahead and get out ahead of it a little and make sure I get all the way to the wall. And then I just kind of use a visual, like, well, it's a little thin right there, and it's not putting out a lot, so it won't look like I've got big streaks, you know, or big places where I threw some out or threw some out. Overall, you want it to where it blends together. You know, just in my visual here, it looks like it might be a little black spot right there. Just a matter of just a little touch there. And uh, a lot of times I go on out ahead and put just a light coat and then go back and look at it compared to the other. And I can tell it's just a little lighter there in the center. And if I'm needing to be a little more precise, I'll get down a little lower. Now, if you get down real low, every one of them's gonna come out right in spot. You wanna keep some height to it. This is strictly just me. I'm a, I'm a farmer slash aircraft restorer. I'm not a floor person. I jumped into this thing head first because it came with AirTech. But my wife had seen this and some people talked about doing it. So I wanted to include it in this video just some of the things that I learned by trial and error. Like I said, make sure you take down that big part. You know, in our office at AirTech, there's two spots that there's, when a big spot comes out, you can't get it back up. And, uh, you know, and I, and I was. I was, you know, going at it, and uh, I had spike shoes on, and, and, and all of a sudden that big end opened up and, and, you know, just made a bad place in the floor. Like I mentioned earlier, now it's time to lock all the dogs and cats and everything in the neighborhood up, because as soon as you get started, they're going to come in here and see what you're doing and, and make a mess or whatever. So, uh, and you can follow him along. He's taking his time and trying to... We're having to do this short because I don't have any spikes, but I can reach this one. Maybe we'll go a foot shorter, Grant, so I'll be able to 
fully reach. That's about my limit. I don't want to start tracking in the paint. But uh, I don't know if anything you want to add that you're doing to it, Grant, to keep the lines down. Or, uh, when you're going off your second coat, you're going to notice that it goes on a lot more evenly. You, the edges from doing each roll are not going to be such a big deal, but it's like on the first coats. When you do have one that you can notice, which there's not one here, but there's kind of one here. All I'm doing is letting the weight of the roller sit and just kind of letting it roll and it'll even out that ridge. And when I'm going to the end, I'm picking it up as I'm rolling it. That way it doesn't leave any roll. See right there, it drips. So I'm gonna let it go out to where that drip was and pick it up to where there won't be any drip or anything. But and just remember, if we go to this end, you know, a lot of people will say, well, I'm gonna do the next five foot. Best thing is to come back down here because this is already setting. And I mean, this is, this is still wet. Don't get me wrong, it's got a good pot life. I mean, you, you've got an hour, in hot weather, you've got over an hour probably of pot life. But when it spreads out thin like this, it's, it's cooking. It, it's, it's heading it, you know, heading on toward curing out. Uh, in 10 minutes or so, which I mean, actually you can't come back and roll with these sprinkles on it. But when you come back to here, now he's gonna have to be careful to reach up and he's, and I'm gonna probably try to make sure that some of these loose ones are blown back and he's gonna have to try to blend, blend into that. What I may do is is start easing up and giving me about a foot of wet paint so that he can blend that end. Like when he comes up to the end of it and then he gets a section, he'll come up here and kind of blend across. So I'll try to get some of these loose ones up because I don't want him to have to come up in here and try to pick some of these up and then, you know, I'm gonna have a line that I've got to start at again. I don't think it's gonna be a problem. So that's just gonna be your own technique. Uh, and also, like right here, it's going to be a high traffic area, so I want to make sure that I put plenty of color down, you know, because that's going to be the main traffic area. So with that, uh, I don't think there's any, going to be any need on doing any filming on following this out. We'll get this done. We'll get the doors kind of set down where nothing can get in here and have plenty of ventilation. Uh, look at the book. Look at the times. Uh, this is Monday afternoon. Uh, He's not going to be back till Friday. We're going to let this thing cure it about Friday before we start putting the clear on. If you push it a little fast, like I said, it can try to react and pull some of this up. So uh, I guess I won't do any more filming today. We'll go ahead and dress this on out. I may do a shot here at the very end with it, just like this before the clear or anything goes on. Stops before it gets to the end because it's going to push a ridge up there and then push the ridge back. And I'll kind of stop those sprinkles about a foot back so that wouldn't be picking them all up with a wet roller. Right there, I've got all my edges worked out except for some little ridges here on the end, so I'm going to try to. Roll them through and roll it out. Got a drip right in the middle. Yeah, if you if you lean it, it's, it'll drip out the end. All right, I want to add one thing that I found figured out. I was filling this up, and the whole time I was shaking it, and as I was shaking it, I'm slowly breaking them and making them smaller. And as I was getting toward the end of it, the pieces was getting a little smaller and a little smaller. So I had to pour it out. And what I'm gonna try to do now is just do just maybe twice that much, just smaller amounts so that I'm not sitting there as I'm shaking it, I'm slowly just breaking them up smaller into a dust because I could notice when I started out, the flakes were bigger. And then as I got across the floor, 
just seeing more and more little tiny ones. So to keep them uniform, these are, we picked these up at a Lowe's or something, Rust-Oleum. But they, as we were shaking them, they were slowly, you know, breaking up and getting smaller, a little bit of a dust coming in with them. So I stopped and poured that out and just started filling it in a smaller amount. So I noticed that as I was putting them out. All right, here's one more thought that I just had. You know, when we give you a quote on a large hanger, it's not as critical as the real small ones, but we, we try to go by square footage that the color covers. And on the raw concrete, the first pass is gonna take a touch more and the second pass, like Grant said, it goes on a lot better on top of the first coat. But don't get in a situation to where you have visually, looks like you have went about halfway across the room, and let's just say you'd put two, a gallon of color and a gallon of cure together, and you've made it halfway. And in your mind say, well, we're gonna do that one more time because we're about halfway. Anytime you get close to the end, uh, start measuring it out and just do it in small increments because there's no carryover when you're done, like especially on your first coat because it's going to set up in the, in the pan, you know, in a few hours. So to keep from having any waste or having to call us back because, you know, you, didn't, you, you think you didn't have enough product, but usually it's because you had to throw some away. As you're getting down toward the end, like right here, we just got one more little two-foot spot. I mixed up probably a total of a third of a gallon of paintable and as he gets toward the end i mean I, I like to see it to where even if i have to mix one cup and one cup catalyst just to finish up to quick you know it i've had it more times than once that i did that what i said a while ago looking at it go well i've, I've about halfway across the room and mix the same amount up and uh, we did that the other day we had over a half a gallon left of mixed product that we that we ruined and had to throw away so just as you get toward the end, you know, have your painters being in good contact with your, with your guy mixing and just start, you know, having some, I use those cheap, just clear mixing cups that you buy at Lowe's or wherever. And that way you can just easily pour up equal amounts. And remember what I said in the beginning about cross-contamination. It's very easy to get ready to, you know, if you've got three quarters of a gallon of each left, is to put the wrong lead on the wrong can. And when you do that, it's gonna ruin the whole can. Make sure that you don't cross contaminate anything. All right, this is Saturday. I think we put that second coat on Monday and there was just stuff that goes on that we didn't get back to doing it, but it's plenty dry. I'll mention it here. I got a few points I'm just gonna cover, but you know, you take your fingernail or a knife or something, you just don't want that real grippy. You want to make sure it's, it's cured and it's good and hard. And that's the reason also we talk about not wanting to put and having ridges, you know, anywhere it's deep, it's going to be harder. I can see a little ridge right here and it's cured also, but that would have been the last thing that cured. You want to try to avoid as much of that as you can. Uh, I think the flakes turned out pretty good at this point. What we did this morning is took a blower just to check it. And it looks like there's very little blue out here, so we were putting it on with it plenty wet. It looks like it all stuck, uh, but it's no price. It's not an issue if you have some that didn't stick. That's the time usually to blow the loose ones off. Uh, I want to cover just a few things here. They're all in our instructions. Um, and, and, you know, the thing is, is to just thoroughly read those instructions all the way through before you, preferably before you even think about starting. I just want to cover a few things that's in here and to the best of my ability to explain what I know about them. The most important thing, though, I found, it's just like painting the aircraft, is not to rush things. Don't get in a hurry. If the weather's not right, postpone it. You know, just, you know, make, make sure that, that you don't rush things and you follow the instructions. And like I've mentioned before, you know, when you start, you know, makes like a, and it sounds funny that, you know, you say, well, what do you mean tie the dogs up? Like, right? you know, you'll be working and all of a sudden you feel something and dogs don't come through and walk through it or something like that. So just be prepared for all that. I think I covered a lot of stuff as I was mixing. Looking over our instructions, I just got a couple things here I want to quick mention. Uh, concrete, brand new concrete. They like to, you know, at 70 degrees, like to see it cured for 25 to 30 days. That way you know the concrete's cured and the moisture's coming out of it. If they used fiber in it and when they finished it, uh, I've never done this, but the instructions call and several of them 
so you can take a, a big torch or a, a butane or something and you can burn that, that off. You can grind that off with a with sander to get those fibers off the top. If you're pouring the new concrete, have your concrete guy not to use a curing sealer. And from what I understand, it's something that they spray on the top that works the same thing as in the old days where they'd lay wet burlap on the top to keep the moisture in it to make it cure a little slower on the concrete. Uh, check it. I, the instructions say you can check it by you don't know if it was put on there or not, put a little water and see if it beads up or whatever. If it does, then your paint's gonna bead up. So you're gonna have to sand it at that point uh, to get that sealer knocked off the top. Um, if it's an old concrete, I mentioned about the Dawn dishwashing liquid or a bicep cleaner. You also usually want, if it's a slick concrete, you know, the instruction says actually a 20 grit, but I think you can actually go a little finer than that. You're wanting to just rough that surface. We talked about the acid etch uh, color. We don't usually have a problem with this. You know, we do the catalyst and we make the hard deck at our place, but the catalyst we buy, but you know, it's not to say someone doesn't make a mistake. If you've got six gallons or whatever of gray or whatever you do, it's a good idea to open all of them and do a visual to see that one of them's not a different shade or something's a little off. And if it is, you need to contact me or if you've got five gallons, four gallons, 10 gallons and open them all, you know, and you got one that looks like it's just a little off, you know, you can con cocktail them together, maybe in five gallon bucks without hardener, and you can blend it to where that color, make the color difference to kind of go away. But I haven't had any problems with any shift. The only thing is that if, if it's like a year or so later or something, and it's a different batch, usually by the standards, it should be right on the money on the match, but you always check that. Uh, we talked about the thinning of it. Don't over thin. If you over thin your first coat, it's not an issue on the hiding effect of it because we're not worried about hiding all the concrete, but uh, just make sure that you don't over thin it. Use what's in the instructions on the amount of thinning. Um, we talked about not rushing it, making sure it's cured before you can do the next coat. Uh, on the hard deck, now that's what I, when I say hard deck, that's the clear. You've got the epoxy color. The hard deck is the clear on the top. You don't want, you know, I mean, the warmer the day, the better it's going to cure, but you don't want to be out in the open or on a really, really hot concrete. If that's the case, you'll want to put this on in the morning. You don't want it to just over catalyze or be too hot. So put your, if it's a really hot day, if you're in South Texas or it's 100 degrees, you may want to start the hard deck early in the morning when it's just a little cooler. Uh, we talked before about mixing only what you need. If you get down to the last point and you start judging, don't mix two gallons of, you know, you know, do it a quarter at a time or whatever, buy the, the little cheap, you know, go buy a paint shop or something, get some canned or something, just so you can, you know, finish up. Cause you know, it's best to have a half a gallon left over you can put on the shelf for a touch up or something else. You may have a sidewalk or whatever, cause when you mix it together, it's a done deal. It's gonna, it's gonna harden. Uh, the hard deck usually always takes one coat, does fine. The book says if you're going to do a second one, wait 24 hours, but be careful. You're going on green hard deck and it can blister, and I've actually seen that happen. I recommend trying to put your, you know, we're going to talk about putting it on. Try to make it happen in the first. I'll go ahead and mention it right now. Uh, the light is an important thing. It wasn't a problem putting this gray on. But there's some lights in here. I don't think we'll have an issue, but if you get a darker hanger, I think I mentioned that the clear is really hard to see sometimes where you've been and you won't really notice until it's over. Now you've got dry spots, you gotta go back and fill those in. So like in here, we may possibly start at this side because we got those window lights coming. But if you do have a dark hanger or something, it might be a good idea to get some stringer lights or some of those cords that has a light bulb every 10 or 15 foot get some good Gorilla tape or something, attach them all to the wall to where you can unplug them from a door without getting back on it and having light. If you haven't had lights put in the hanger yet, something to get that reflection as you're going. Uh, and I just try to avoid, you know, trying to do a second coat on that also. Uh, the first month, you want to avoid any chemical spills. If you have something, you know, Acid or something spill on it, try to wipe it up pretty quick in that first month. 
Uh, if you're going to have vehicle traffic on it, uh, I like to see at least three days, you know, till it's cured good before you put in your vehicle traffic. And the instruction says if you are going to park on it in that first month, maybe a piece of cardboard or something under the tire to kind of test it, you know, make sure it's not going to sit long enough and try to stick. You know, you might park it for a half hour and then back back off and, and make sure. But uh, it's three days to have vehicle traffic. But uh, it says use cardboard for the first couple of weeks, you know, because it, it's, still, it's still slowly cured during that time. Uh, avoid any rubber mats that has a rubber backing for a month. You putting that down on it, it's sealing off any more evaporation or curing. You want to avoid rubber mats that have has a rubber backing on it. Uh, we talked before about putting the flakes on and putting them on for, for uh, traction purposes. I did read one thing where uh, in our instructions, say if you've got a doorway up north where there's always going to be ice or something coming in or you're afraid of a slick spot, in that second coat of color, you can put one to two ounces per mixed gallon of sand. You know, and then you're not going to see it. It's going to be hid in the gray, but you can mix it that way to give it a texture and then the clear coat will go over it and, uh, and you can't see the sand for that. Uh, in the instructions, whenever we're talking about temperatures and cure times, we're talking about concrete, not the air. Uh, you don't want a situation where, the, you know, well, it's got to 70 today, but the concrete's actually 50 or something. We're talking about temperatures of the concrete. And, uh, you know, you, you don't want to, if you've got heat in the heat in the hanger or whatever you want to heat, you want to go ahead and get everything heated up before you start. You don't want your uh, chemical, your hard deck and stuff out in the cold and then bringing it in cold. You want it warmed up that before you mix. That way it speeds up the... The, the process of curing, but it's the same situation of uh, you've got a cold concrete and you put the stuff down there, you start turning the heat on. It could be a situation like a cold glass out in the humid, hot summer and start sweating. You don't want to have those situations where the barometer is on a change to where it's been kind of cool and it's in the wintertime now it's warming up and it's fixing to be water on all the windows and dripping. You want to avoid those moist type days. Uh, during the curing process, it's good to have places where it's ventilated, preferably some air moving over the first day uh, to not, you'll actually have a boundary layer can get right on the surface and hinder curing. Uh, it's still going to cure, but it's the same thing with our process. We talk about painting a wing when you've covered it and you've put the primer on. Uh, the other side of that fabric inside, we talk about evacuating out the air in the wing. It, hinders the cure a little bit from the other side. So it's the same way here. It'll have a boundary layer if you don't have air kind of moving. It don't take a lot, but just some type of air moving. And the last thing is, is be careful that you don't do the whole floor. You've done painted it. Now you're fixing to get your kerosene heater and you're gonna stick its nose in there. This stuff is flammable. And be, you know, you don't want a big hanger full of fumes that, you know, you want to be careful on that. Maybe electric heat or already have the air moving as you naturally want the air moving while you're putting this on, but have that air moving and it is flammable. I mean, I, I, I don't know what the air mix ratio would be to actually catch on fire in the air, but you want to be careful with that open flames and stuff. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and start mixing. We've done talked about the mixing, but on the hard deck, it is two parts hard deck to one part catalyst. And we're going to go ahead and, and get stuff mixed up with already. It's the same process as doing the clear. We're going to go ahead and now get stuff mixed up and started in it. And I'll start the video back when I start putting it down. All right, we're going to start applying the, the clear. And it's the same process as putting on the color. Uh, I like to just keep the pan pushed out in front of me. Uh, that way any drips, I'm working that way. Uh, you don't want to push up. A big pile toward the end. You want to, you know, reach up and grab it back. Uh, you're doing these kind of W's, you might say, across the room, and it doesn't ridge up quite as bad on the edges as the color. So what you want to avoid is on a hot day to just keep working and then coming back over and coming back over because it's not going to be like a slick glass. It's going to be just a little bit modeled, but it's going to slowly lay out. And every time you go back over it, now you're hindering it again from it laying out. So try to just, in your mind, as you go, you're wanting to come back about half of the, the, the roller and go back about half the roller. 
and then keep the rotor good and wet. If you get out here and get to doing big gaps and you got big V's in between, that's where you usually will mess up and start having a, a dry spot. So it's basically the same situation. We're gonna start at this end because I got this light reflecting on the floor. Uh, and and I can you know pretty well see where the shiny's at and we're we working our way out. Alright, we finished it. This is about a thousand square foot garage. Took us probably 50 minutes on the clear to, to work our way out. Everything's flowing out pretty good. We'll just leave some of these doors cracked. And, uh, and like I said before, the clear over time will flatten out actually off of the, the little flake so it'll make a little texture for the floor for slickness. And there will always be a little bit of a texture to it, but you can see that it does shine. So it'd be kind of like on painting an aircraft, it, you know, a little orange peel to it. And that's about all I can say for putting on hard deck. And, and when you do call to order it, I'm there on the phone. Anytime you have questions, I'll do my best to help talk you through them and, and get you through the project.